you know what ended up happening. So today ended up being a crazy day and we ended up losing people as the day went along. And then we decided because this gets recorded, we're still going to go through with the interviews um, and the and have the conversations and questions. Um, and then the others can watch it and then we can have the, uh, a deliberative session at the next meeting to kind of talk about it. But we, we wanted to make sure we had this, it took this opportunity um, because we had wanted as a city to kind of have somebody on board in March and that got pushed to now and now it's getting pushed into July. So we're trying to keep as much on track as we can. So I apologize for the way it worked out. And then of course, um, we had scheduled to have a break of time at the start for everyone as commissioners to talk before we had the first uh, SE group come on for six and then you guys come on for 630. So that's why we asked you to kind of flip because we don't have anything to do for half an hour. So, so that was a little introduction of, um, of uh, why things are a little bit slow for today. No problem. We're happy to be here regardless. Let me. Send this back here. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, if uh, Aiden, if you can wait till six, we'll have um, originally we were going to have you on at well, you guys were on at six and they were going to be on at 630 and we just rolled them forward to 530 because of our schedule. But if you could wait till six to join us, that would be great. Awesome. I'll see you then. Thank you. All right. Yep. All right. So I guess we can jump right in, Gabe, if you want me just to go and kind of run this thing through. Yeah, I think since there's not any, uh, I, I am uh, the vice chair, planning commissioner, Aaron's a planning commissioner. We're grateful to have you here. Sorry that we don't have a quorum. We're missing a member. And then somebody else was traveling and somebody else had to step out. So anyway, we, as Mike described, we'll look at this later. Mike, just go ahead and you know, run the meeting if you would, and we'll have the two presentations and have our formal meeting in a couple of weeks. All right. And Jeff uh, Batista is also here uh, joining us. So he's the third planning commissioner. Um, so I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director here for the city of Montpelier. And um, really quick, I mean, you guys have obviously looked through the um, RFP and I'll just go through really quick for the general public, anyone who may be watching this on ORCA um, or watching this after the fact. So what this project has been is a, uh, the city is working on the city plan update. Uh, we've been working on it for about four years now. And our goal is to, um, when we update the city plan, as we update the city plan, that we move this plan into kind of into the, into the 21st century, into the next century here. Let's go for a web-based plan. Um, most of the printed documents don't get used. Uh, they sit on the shelves. Uh, and our hope is that having something online will catch a few more people with a few more web searches of different topics. If people are interested in housing, uh, then at least we'll start to grab some people. And we wanted to also take the opportunity to create um, storybooks for each topic, each of the 12 chapter topics. So that way we could try to use this as an educational opportunity for the public to go through what's important, why is this topic uh, being discussed, and then to talk briefly about our implementation strategy. And if they want more information, we can then link to a bunch of other things. So rather than having a 400 page city plan, we can condense it down to more of a bite-sized piece. And for people who want more information, they can drill into more information, but we can go through and, and get the, the important, tell the important story to the public. And so that's a lot of um, what we want. And so by looking at ArcGIS, um, we also know it has tools for public input. So we wanted to be able to try to take advantage of some of these tools. But um, other than John Adams, who some of you may know, John is a VCGI director. Um, he's the only one on our planning commission or staff that really has any GIS experience. So we're really all novices and we're kind of hoping we'll get some help from somebody who's gonna come in and kind of show us what's the best way to work with this media to talk about uh, how, how to write a good story, how to tell a good story within this storyboard media. And, uh, and that's, a, you know, 
uh, generally our uh, kind of big picture of what we're trying to do. So I guess I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, we, we did put out the RFP um, just for the public's benefit. Uh, we had a $20,000 budget, which was from our general fund. We then after, or like the day the, the grant closed or our RFP closed, we got a $10,000 grant that had previously been denied. They came through. So we had 30,000. Our grant required us to repost it, which we did. Um, and we have two responses. So uh, we'll be interviewing both folks tonight. Um, so now I'll turn it over to you and, and let you guys give a brief presentation. Like I said, we've got about 20 minutes to a half an hour to kind of go through a presentation, have some question and answer. And, um, and if you have any questions for us, by all means, um, let us know. Great. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, thank you all for having us here. We're excited to be considered for this project. Um, so I'll start with myself. My name is Warren Rich from Stone Environmental. I'm a um, project GIS specialist here. So I um, um, do GIS technical tasks, a lot of ArcGIS online development, um, working with hub, story maps, web applications, um, standard web maps, um, kind of whatever the, whatever the specific needs are for. Um, in addition to that, I also um, manage a lot of projects that are um, more taking ArcGIS Online's capabilities beyond what they're able to do, um, just kind of standard out of the box ArcGIS Online functionality. Um, we do have a team of uh, web developers who can you know, really take and build things from the, the ground up. Um, I don't foresee that being as much of a need for this project, but um, we do that along the line sometimes. Um, I've been in Stone about four years now, and I got my master's in 2018 in um, GIS for sustainability from University of Washington. Um, yeah, I think I'll give a kind of rundown of Stone later, but why don't we let uh, Paige go ahead and introduce herself. She's the other uh, kind of the primary uh, technical um, person who would work on this project. Yeah, thanks, Warren. So I'm Paige Gebhardt. I also work at Stone. Um, I'm a GIS specialist. I just started in the beginning of March at Stone. Um, prior to that, I worked at the state of Michigan for four years in their um, Department of Natural Resources. And then I also did a little stint in Texas uh, as a contractor with the Air Force. Um, but at, at my time in the state of Michigan, I did a lot of work on story maps and communicating to the public using maps and then also other kinds of media. Um, so I do a lot of GIS, but I am, I, well, good at, I'm interested in um, the design aspects of presenting information um, and presenting information to the public. Um, so I've worked quite a bit with like communications representatives at my time at the DNR. So I'm quite tuned into um, communicating well to the public. Awesome, next page. Um... Yeah, and I guess uh, just a brief kind of introduction to Stone as a company. Um, we're located right in Montpelier on uh, Stonecutter's Way, the big three-story building right on the river right there. Um, Stone's been around for about 30 years, longer than I've been there I was when they started. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, they're, we're pretty diverse for only being a 50-person company, but um, our particular group, which is the Geospatial and Data Solution team, um, really focuses on um, developing what's become more recently web-based kind of solutions for um, varying varying sectors, really. Um, you know, a lot of it because we're an environmental consulting firm lands in the um, kind of environmental or natural resources world. So we're a lot of local and state governments for um, you know, various things kind of like the city plan. Um, we recently worked with the regional planning commissions to develop a hub system for them to um, be able to kind of manage their data in a single place and collaborate with each other. Um, so yeah, you know, that's our, our focus kind of varies from just standard data crunching, GIS analysis to, um, you know, just full on developing hub applications or story maps, um, telling stories through data and maps. Um, and visualizations is really kind of um, specialty. So that's pretty much the uh, rundown for Stone. Um, 
we don't have, you know, I guess a specific presentation, no PowerPoint or anything. Um, we want to make sure there's time to kind of talk, assuming everybody's read the um, proposal we sent, you know, we can kind of go through the proposal or relevant projects that we um, included in there. But um, I guess, you know, I think Mike had mentioned kind of, um, you know, focusing on what we feel the strengths of our proposal are. Um, so I think a lot of that comes down to really our ArcGIS Online specialty. Um, we've been an Esri Silver partner for six or seven years now. Um, we work closely with Esri to stay on top of emerging technologies and platforms that they present. Um, ArcGIS, ArcGIS Hub being one of them. That's why we were really kind of excited to see this proposal come out because it's Montpelier where we work, um, where Paige lives. I don't know if it, but, uh, it was um, really exciting to kind of have those two worlds converge. Um, you know, RTIS Hub has been something we've been really excited about for a while, and we're using more and more of it for um, you know a lot of different things. It's a really versatile platform. Um, so, anyways, it was really cool. We were excited to see that coming about. And um, you know, Stone did. I think it was four years ago. It was just before I started. Um, kind of. Our first delve into Hub was with the city of Montpelier building the Access Montpelier Hub site, which um, looks like it's been built upon a little bit since we kind of left hands on it. But I think the uh, snowplow tracker was the big, um, the kind of shiny part of that one. It was a pretty cool way to kind of track you know, where your plow is in real time. But yeah, um, you know, I think we, again, we try and stay on top of all the modern technology. Hub is still relatively new, but again, we've been working with it for about four years, we're finding more and more ways to extend it and do more things with it. Um, it's a great visual platform to just get your content out, tell your story, just, you know, get things out, um, as well as including more um, dynamic content, applications, data, and um, community engagement and feedback is another big part of it. Um, you know, various um, you know, steps within ArcGIS at Hub that allow the community to engage in different ways. But um, you know, there's there's really a lot there, and I think it's a really great um, great tool and platform for this type of um, web-based city plan. So yeah, um, I guess on top of just our excitement about Hub in general, you know, again, we're, we're in Montpelier. Um, I don't live there, but I work there 40 hours a week, um, really involved. Um, you know, I think just being local, we have local knowledge and, you know, a little stake in this work as well beyond just, you know, a cool project. Um, it's, it's really applicable to a lot of, a lot of people at Stone who have lived in Montpelier for a long time, paid yourself in Montpelier. Um, you know, it's it's a cool way that we can be involved with the community and help out the community by, um, yeah, you know, kind of taking the city plan, which is a, a dense, complex, long document, um, breaking it down into more digestible sections. Um, and, you know, my, as Mike was saying, you know, kind of throwing out the big picture ideas and letting people drill down into further what they, you know, if they want to read the actual document, we'll have that there for them. But, um, you know, in, in a world of, you know, I want it now, I want to see, give me the, you know, short and dirty of it. I just want to see the, you know, one thing what it is. Um, it's really important to have that, um, yeah, that user experience, I guess, as we would call it, um, to make it more digestible and user friendly for the general public. So um, I think that's about it for my my spiel for Stone and why we're excited for it. Um, you know, the proposal was fairly, fairly open-ended. I think there was a lot of, um, you know, the, the RFP said what the city wants and what the goals are for it. How exactly we get to that um, is a little less uncertain. Um, but one thing that we do really with any of our projects and it is an important part of how we work is we just work closely with our clients on constant communication contacts um you know we're not going to take something and then get back to you a month later and say here this is done you know no time for comment no time for feedback we really are um banking and counting on the city planning commission and the city to um be an active participant in the development of this work um you know we are very knowledgeable about what 
ArcGIS can or can't do, um, ArcGIS Online, and how to do it. Um, whereas the rest of you are the experts on the subject material, and you're putting together this long document, are intimately familiar with it. So this kind of collaboration between us and you know clients or all of you is um, really how we work with anything. It's an iterative process and development. And a lot of that plays into the budget as well. You know, we don't want to promise, you know, endless abilities when, um, yeah, the budget is what it is. So a lot of that is this iterative development. We'll come back, say, okay, this is where we're at. This might take a little bit more. Let's shelf that until we can get the, you know, core into place and really kind of iteratively develop it as we go, keeping in mind budget and your needs. Um, so I think I put something in there again considering the nice to haves and the must haves. Um, and we, we will always consider the nice to haves and you know, hopefully be able to provide all of the nice to haves, but really you know, understanding those must haves and then working down into the nice to haves as we go is um, you know, I, I think the best way for everybody to be on the same page about realistic expectations for what can be done, as well as you know, making sure the core points are always getting done. and. Um, you know, it can be developed on later. That's another part of the thing about the ArcGIS Online platform. It is somewhat user-friendly. Um, it's easy for us to say we have our hands in it all day, every day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's low to no code. There's, you don't need a web developer to go in there and update some content or, you know, add another paragraph, throw in another picture if you have something new. Um, this is something that can be maintained by the city more long-term, um, you know, without necessarily the need to have um you know, a contractor on hand for continuous constant support and development. Oh, Paige, do you have anything else to add? I think, I think you hit all my main points as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of my like, summary of what, how we feel about our proposal and um, why we're well suited to do this work. Um, do anybody want to ask questions right now? We have some kind of examples of projects similar we've worked up that we can show, but um, I'll kind of, I guess, throw that back out and see, um, see what all of you think. That was actually my, my question was, uh, you know, if you've got, I, I've been able to look through some of what you did for the city of Montpelier. Um, it looks like the other master plan, there might have been something for, uh, was, it, was it Bennington area? Yep. But that was a PDF. That was sort of an older, that was kind of an older school. So do you have any examples you could point to of something that was web-based that we could look at? Yeah. Let me share. Okay. Um, yeah, so... I guess just in general, this is our, um, this is the hub site as well, but this is kind of our, um, our portfolio, if you will. It um, has a lot of relevant projects. And, um, if in your, you know, free time, if you want to look, dig in a little bit more, there's a lot of examples of different types of web applications we've developed here. Um, so we plucked out kind of a, a few from here that we think are most relevant. The Bennington plan, um, Mentioned seeing you mentioned it was a PDF. This is still a live story map. It's an old story map. Um, as you can kind of tell, if you viewed a story map recently, they don't look like this anymore. Um, Esri is continually updating um, and improving their story map platform. But this was, I'll say, I did not work on this personally. This is where I arrived at Stone, but this was a big project that was done um, by our environmental assessment and remediation um, team at. Stone, um, they did the kind of work to read, um, do the cleanup that was needed for a lot of this redevelopment. But then the GDS team took on this um, story map working with the city of Bennington to um, kind of get this area wide plan into a story map format. It tells the history, um, the images, we got the maps, all the different, you know, all, all these kind of elements combined. And you know, we can see this format of story maps, again, looking a little bit different nowadays than they did, I think this was six or seven years ago. This is a, an old one, but um, yeah, just another way of kind of getting all this that would have been one long, you know, PDF document that um, really hard to sift and breaking it out into sections. 
um, that are a little more digestible with some media behind it. Um, what else? Let's see. Here is another example of something. Again, this is a slightly old. This one's three years old, but it was just before they, um, um, Esri, as they updated their formats. And um, this is some um, uh, work I'm involved in, kind of doing GIS technical lead for our water resources department. Um, PDS, you know, in addition, our team, in addition to taking on projects of our own, we also other projects that um, the water resources or the environment assessment mitigation teams might take up. Um, but this was a status update for uh, the phosphorus control plan that we're developing for Vermont Agency of Transition or VTAN. Um, historically, these have been long, long dense PDF documents that, um, you know, again, you just kind of have to sift through. And um, we were actually able to provide this as a um, official. Um, submittal to the DEC as part of the requirements of the plan for VTRANS, um, which is really cool to be able to, you know, kind of come into the 21st century with these submittals rather than doing just a paper submittal, um, do something a little more dynamic. But uh, yeah, again, this one kind of goes through and just lays out the background, the history, why what's being done has been done. It even includes one of these really long kind of it's PDFs in it, um, so you know you can you know, I guess override the ease of the story map by uh, you know plugging in one of these documents into it. Um, let me get a little further down, and there's see some of the uh, maps. Yeah, there's a map. Here's a dashboard that we're able to plug into it. So yeah, and this I guess the main reason. Yeah, that's another that's really useful. Thank you for showing that. Looks like Cameron had a question. Okay. I did. Thank you. Um, I'm Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm the assistant city manager. I had some questions about, um, I tried to skim through your present, your proposal, um, and it didn't really talk about longevity to me and like how, how would you propose getting like staff, right? You said that it's maintainable. How, how do you bring staff along and how much training or time afterwards would be put into this project? Yeah, of course. Paige, do you want to yeah, definitely. This is um, a bit similar to what we're doing with the Vermont Community Broadband Board right now. Um, on another project, we're working on data maintenance. Yeah, there's the site there, um, a hub site and various applications to show data. What we're doing on this project is um, working directly with someone at the VCBB. Um, she's we're working for her, but also she is curious about how these things work. She wants to be able to keep it up after our work is done. Um, so what I've been doing is teaching her, like I was working on a dashboard recently and I walked her through how I'd created it. Um, she's got access, she can get in and edit it, it herself. So I could foresee for the city, um, as we work on this project, we could um, teach, we could have like training sessions, we can screen share, um, show how we're building things, and then make sure that it's accessible to your team um, to be able to edit into the future uh, and maintain. And hopefully, I know Warren had mentioned that Esri continues to update their story map platform. This ArcGIS story maps now are supposed to be um, have good longevity, last into the future as they make updates. Um, we should be able to keep our story maps where they are and they just get updated behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, so that's that's what I would imagine we would do. And that's a great question. So would that, would that training and that time be something you would add into your proposal sort of formally or and within the same pricing structure? Is that an additional something? I think if we were, you know, I didn't see necessarily training um, listed in the RFP specifically. Um, you know, if we wanted to do any kind of real official training, um, you know, more than just a few hours, it would probably be something we need to consider within the budget. Um, I do think the budget is somewhat flexible. Um, I mean, again, given just the um, um, kind of broad nature of it right now, we can, you know, work certainly to keep that in mind as we go and make sure that there's enough time at the end for an official training if need be. Um, but again, as Pays mentioned, um, taking any top opportunity along the way to provide 
little bit of detail and info and just, oh, hey, let's you know show you how this works real quick. Um, but I, I could also foresee as part of the, the official handoff, um, you know, just an, an hour or two long training session to get everybody together in one room and kind of go through the, the nuts and bolts. And, um, you know, it is all really configurable and um, accessible without code. So, um, you know, the learning curve isn't too steep, although, you know, you need to kind of know, know where to click kind of thing. Thank you. And we'll have some advantage in that. We do have Zach Blodgett who is trained yep. in being able to do these, but the other advantage is really the longevity as Paige pointed out of the document because the, the plan has to be fixed. We won't be able to go in and continually update the plan because it would have to go through. Hey, Mike, I think, I think you're covered. You've covered up your microphone. I can barely hear you. Still can't really hear you. All right. I don't know why. It's been a problem. That was better now to me. Is it better now? Yes. Yeah. All right. It's been strange how it gets good and bad from time to time. Um, so yeah, so we've had we have Zach, um, and one piece is just it's gonna be a fixed document um to a point. Uh, we do want to have opportunities, you know, and we'll talk about, you know, whatever when we when we reach that point of, we want to be able to gather public input into the future and use this document, but there'd have to be kind of a line that either has kind of dynamic data. So if we have something that's that's stealing from another site or something that we plug in that's dynamic, has to be below a line, because officially the plan can't change without going through a formal readoption process. So we're kind of we want to talk about some of these opportunities that might be there to, to kind of make a plan that says this is what our goals are and then maybe there's some sort of line that then gets us to a dynamic portion that shows us progress. But that, that's for a conversation down the road a little bit. Um, but we do have Zach and um, I, I think that'll be a big help yeah. for maintenance. Uh, I have kind of a more basic question. This largely comes from sort of my lack of tech savvy, but I think one of the things that I keep thinking about as we move towards this online model is, is being cognizant that in Montpelier, we're going to be dealing with, uh, it's going to be released to a public audience that has varying levels of comfort with technology. And I'm curious what sort of considerations you guys may have taken into account in thinking about how to develop these storyboards, how to solicit public input, um, you know, linking documents. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, you know, I one of the good things about Hub in general to me is, you know, Hub can become this kind of confusing, what is Hub? You know, I think we hear that a lot of people don't, almost scared of it because they're not sure what it is. It's really a website builder. So it will interact and, you know, the user will interact just like they would a standard website with it. So, um, you know, here in the BCBB one, this one's based a lot around data currently, but not stories, but, um, you know, it, it'll be as intuitive as a standard website would be. So I think anybody with, you know, general comfort navigating a website should be able to navigate through this as well but you know a lot of that comes into how we develop it as well um, you know and I think that's a big part of what we're going to do is help guide all of you into you know the best way to um, format it and organize it and you know present it in a way that does make sense in a basic web type format that flows well that's not you know you have to get five clicks to get somewhere to uh, a single point of information i um, really presenting it all in the best way possible. So, um, you know, that's something that we do with any any kind of public facing application website like this that we develop. Um, we keep user experience in mind, and um, you know, best practices and guiding principles for web design throughout the process. So, um, yeah, um, you know, that's definitely something that's going to be at the forefront of everything that we're doing in this is making sure that it is accessible. And, um, you know, intuitive to a wide audience. Like you say, you know, there's a varying degree of technological savvy um, who end users for this or what will become the city plan. So yeah, that's, you know, part of what we do daily. So. 
to the answer to your question. Right. I hate to cut everybody off, but we're wrapping up to six o'clock, rolling into six. So uh, if do you have any last uh, questions or comments you want to let the commission know about um, before we move on? Uh, I don't think so. Um, thank you all for having us here. Um, we, we hope we've answered all your questions. Um, we're excited about this project. Again, it's, it's not often that we get to work directly within our, within our community on something that we're really excited about and that we do a lot of anyway. So um, this is an exciting project. And um, yeah, I hope you'll consider our, our proposal. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, thanks. And thanks for your time. Yeah, and thanks for being so flexible. Of course. Of course. <laughs> stop sharing so I can get off here. Okay. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Have a Bye. great night. All right. Let me ping Mark here. Hello, everybody. Hi, Mark. How are you? Sorry about that. I thought we were on at six. I thought I'd get in here a few minutes early. I didn't realize Stone was going ahead of us. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> yeah, that's the 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 uh, the change of plans was that our planning commission very slowly went from seven to six to five to four to three, and then oh. um, so we without a quorum, we we kind of had a decision, and we decided. We're still going to do the interviews. We, we're kind of behind schedule on a lot of stuff, and and this was something we wanted to make sure we got done um, because this is being recorded. The other commissioners are going to uh, watch it afterwards and kind of see the presentations um, and okay. kind of go through kind of go through that way. Um, so I think I kind of gave the the summary last time to to um, to the previous folks, but really. You know, our so our projects, um, our goal is to kind of work towards having a web-based plan, and uh, we wanted to build it with storyboards. It was really, you know, we, we've seen a couple of these. We thought it would be a great idea. Um, you know, we've got this 200-page, 300-page plan, and we want to try to start to get it into more bite-sized pieces where the public might interact with it more. And we've seen this on, um, whether it's national competitions, and other things where these web plans are accessed and used more often. And so that's why we want to kind of move in this direction. But we as staff um, don't really have any experience uh, and, com and commissioners don't have this experience, except for John Adams, who you probably know, oh, yeah. VGIS director. Um, so we really are kind of relying on getting a consultant who's going to help us to, to not only take care of the technical pieces, but also teach us how to have a conversation in this media how can we tell how can we create storyboards how can we tell the story how can we inform the public because we're going to have to adjust our narrative as we learn how to how to write in this format how to best communicate so we we kind of need a little bit of that lesson a little bit of that learning and then also the third little piece of what we're trying to do is to we know ArcGIS hub has great ways of uh doing public input both during and after the plan is up and running. And so we wanted to take advantage of those. Again, we don't know, we, we just know that it can do it. And so mm -hmm. we really want to have take advantage of full advantage of what opportunities are there. And so that's what we're hoping to get from the um, from the various consultants. And I guess at this point, we'll turn it over to you guys, give you guys a, a couple of minutes to kind of make some presentation of yep. what you guys have. And Great, great. Uh, thank you all for this opportunity to chat today. Um, Mike and I, you know, we talked a long time ago about this and this sort of idea of of establishing a, a an online city plan. You know, something that was uh, accessible and approachable to average resident. Obviously, as as you noted, the current plans tend not to be that way because they're so 
thick. Um, the biggest part of this project, and you know, Aiden Eichhoff is with me today. She's actually traveling, so she's going to be just on audio, but I'll, I'll make sure Aiden has a chance to talk a lot um, about some of these projects we worked on. But a key thing, I think, the key distinction between maybe other teams and our team is, is, one of those, is that because we're a planning firm, that's our job. We're community planning based practice. My practice is community based practice. It's that act of curating the information in a way that takes it from the uh, policy document to the public that is really kind of the most important thing. It's easy to get bogged down in the technology or get hung up in the technology aspects of this and going to an online version of anything is going to be wrought with some of those technical compromises and issues they have to deal with. But at the core of it, you can't lose sight of the fact that this is a planning document that needs to communicate something. It needs to tell the, the community about what the policies of the city are, what the vision of the city is. It has to be able to communicate those things in an accessible way so that it's not limiting um, in that delivery. That's really, really super important. Um, we've got to be careful about stepping on accessibility in this process. And to do that effectively, even though ESRI provides a really good platform, a really good starting point, what we have found is that you need to have um, a graphic artist's eye to curate the information in a way that actually is, is more, uh, uh, can, can help facilitate that process better. Um, GIS maps on the, you know, the, the raw GIS data maps you might see are awesome, but a lot of times they hide um, the point. It's harder to get the point out with using those. So what we've we've often done, and I'll show you some examples of this, we've often done is kind of hybridize our story maps to include a variety of online mapping tools, integrated mapping tools that ESRI provides um, for spatial information with graphics that we prepare that clarify and and curate and sort of focus the points of key issues, whether they're policy issues or questions or whatever they might be in the, in the planning context so that somebody can understand them in a more accessible way. So that's a really big part, I think, of, of one of the things that we sort of approach this project with. And we are glad to see that you've got some additional resources to sort of expand that because we think that part of it is gonna be really super important. We know that Mike and your, your team can put together a great city plan. You know, you know that city better than anybody. Um, but being able to take that information and turn it into a mean into a uh, uh, into information that can be shared on an electronic platform and is accessible and works across different devices, which is also going to be a huge issue um, for this. We want to make sure it works on a phone because that's how most people are going to look at this and us GIS people with our big screens and stuff. That's not how the world is probably going to look at this. I think that's going to be a really important piece. Way uh, important part of this project is to get the the uh, the art of curating your information in a way that can then be delivered um, through story mapping on a hub site that lets it um, get out there and be able to be engaging. It won't be engaging if it's just data on a website. That's for sure. Um, Aiden, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, maybe give a little bit of a overview? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Sorry. I don't, Mark, I don't know if you hopped off, but I saw that the other group was still presenting and I was like, oh, I got to go. <laughs> yeah, I took off my headphones and went into the kitchen. And <laughs> so, yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yes. Hi. Uh, as Mark said, I am uh, traveling, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just not presentable right now, <laughs> um, but I did just want to, again, commend you guys for taking this next step towards an online plan. Um, it's something that we often grapple with when we get to the end of a process and we're like, okay, now we got to write it up. And as much as we try to not make a 90 page document, it turns into a 90 page document. Um, so absolutely taking that and translating it so that it's um, more inviting uh, for the general person to look at, I think is just a really great endeavor. Um, this conversation absolutely reminds me of the work that we completed for the Kingdom Trails. It's one of those story maps that was uh, highlighted in our in our proposal, um, where we got to the end of that, and we didn't want to put a plain document together because we knew that that was not going to be the right way to communicate these the the ideas because it was graphic rich and because it was map 
mapping rich and spatially rich. Um, and that I, I really, really enjoyed that process, taking out um, a lot of our complex methodology and analysis and saying, like, nope, we can link, we can link those in our story map to the people who really want to get into the details. Uh, but we, we need to make this as digestible as possible. Um, and the story map's still, still a bear to get through, um, but it has, it has the key ideas highlighted. Um, and I, and I truly do believe that um, the information can be accessed from a range of perspectives and a range of uh, knowledge abilities. So um, I hope that this, that this product can be similar in that I think the hardest, hardest thing that we'll have to do is pare down the amount of information without losing, um, without losing its richness. And I think that's, that's an exciting, but it's going, it's going to be quite the task. So as Mark said, um, appreciate that there is more both financial support and also uh, city staff support to to get that end. Great, thank you, Aiden. So, Aiden, um, I think what we might want to do is like I'm trying to get the the Kingdom Trails to show up on the screen here. See if I can do that. That was an example. All right, all right. I'm not sure. Yeah, you see and let, us, and let us know, Mike and team, if you have you, any questions that came yeah. up. But I just wanted to sort of that as a backdrop to this. I mean, I think one of the things that, um, you know, you'll sort of notice in this story map is this kind of thing, this infographic-y thing. You know, Esri doesn't do these. <laughs> it doesn't do those. <laughs> those are things that our team actually does in terms of, part, you know, communicating complicated information and finding a way to actually get it to make it understandable. And again, that's the kind of thing where you the be, the benefit of a, of story map is you can do that. You can embed those kinds of images or illustrations or whatever they might be to help understand to get, to help make the points a little more clear. But it's it's super, um, and so that's one of the reasons we like it as a platform because it's super flexible for dealing with all that kind of information. But again, we've had we found in our process that you know. Listening to community, listen to an organization, try to understand what they're trying to do, trying to understand what they're trying to sell or communicate. Finding a way to actually present that can be really challenging. But as Aiden said, this this trend was also super graphic rich, and one of the key things on that was to be able to highlight the spatial aspect of. Let me go down to the spatial aspect of it. Here we go. So you can see, and this is a this is a GI this is an ArcGIS. Uh, you know, this is an actual image that we made with ArcGIS combination of Illustrator because it actually, as a map, reads better. This is not a native ESRI map, <laughs> as an example. And part of that was because we wanted to make sure these, these this information was as readily understandable and, and relatable as possible. So that's an area where I think, in in the in the interest of of getting this out to the public and to have it have the most valuable value it's sometimes better to um focus more information and to do that you may have to sort of drop some of the esri tools in favor of a combination of esri related tools and some other tools like illustrator adobe products that kind of thing which let you expand the um scope and scale of, of spatial information even in a way that's more powerful that's a that's one area where we've sort of spent a lot of sort of time in curation. In other words, sort of is also making the interactivity of these maps very, again, very visually compelling and clear so that it's not um, super challenging. If you look at this on your phone, what it does is it shows you the area in question and then the infographic comes up afterward to kind of communicate the point. So that's a, a way of accommodating that end user. Something I wanna highlight here while we're looking at this is that um, this is the classic version of story maps, and it has now gone to what we call new story maps. I don't know actually what the official word is, um, but we've done probably about 20 or 30 of our projects now. At, yeah, now you're looking at a new version of the story map, um, which have many of the same tools, but um, more mobile, tablet, and computer 
friendly, like it's uh, optimized for that because classic story maps wasn't optimized for that. Um, so now it ensures that if someone does open it on a phone, they have the same experience um, or as good of an experience as someone that has it on the computer. Um, and also uh, Esri has a tool called Survey123 that can be easily embedded in these new story maps. So as we continue to talk about what sort of engagement strategies that we wanna embed in this, that you guys can have ongoing um, engagement with these plan updates as it gets built out. Uh, that's absolutely something that this tool can be, can be used really well for. I think a, an important aspect of this project though is gonna be back to the, I think the kind of the core of the, of the, of the ask, and that is to make sure that you know what the again this is i think one of the neat things about this project is is how do you comply how do you meet all the statutory requirements in terms of delivering a plan like this while you want to take advantage of some of those engagement tools you got to be careful about that feedback loop around that it's like you know they, the plan's the plan when the plan is adopted the plan is the city's plan <laughs> that's got to kind of stay sacrosanct relative to city policy and all of that there can be discourse and dialogue associated with the plan, but I think in, in visually and then in the organization of the plan, the, 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 of the story map and the way it's communicated, I think there needs to be some uh, very clear accommodation for delivery of what is what is in the plan, what is officially adopted and officially, you know, policy of the city versus where is the, where is there in, is interest or issues related to discourse around a policy or, or issue. Um, that, that information, that, that sort of engagement information could be super helpful for the city and for you guys as you think about what you might do want to do to amend the plan down the road or make adjustments in city policy for sure. But um, I think we need to be very, tread very carefully on, on crowdsourcing policy because <laughs> that's, that, that's not how the planning process works, right? There is going to be an adoption. There's going to be a, an acceptance of what's in the plan and that needs to be um, commun communicated and clear to everybody. Um, and, and then I think that's where the hub site might come really, you know, come into this really well structurally. So the plan itself could exist as a story map because that's a curated experience. You have purposefully pulled together the relevant information and um, I'm just going to pan through some other ones we're working on right now. This is a uh, stormwater, Vermont State Stormwater Master Plans summary study we're working on. Um, you, you purposefully bring together the information, you organize it, you can control what's, your, what's being seen, how it's being seen, what's being presented. Very clearly, great tool for that. The hub site, embedded in a hub site though, could allow for some interactivity around the story map, around the plan, right? So you could look at the hub as a, a community engagement add-on to the story map that would allow for discourse around specific policy issues or thematically issues. For example, each one of these uh, subsites could could be a part of the plan, economic development, uh, whatever structure you want to do. A hub site could be associated with one of those subsites, and that would allow for an engagement around uh, economic policy, for example. But the plan, the plan stays the plan. The plan is the plan. So that's where I think the, the, the careful um, road mapping in our, in our proposal kind of taught me the first phase of our proposal is to figure this out. <laughs> like what is the right structure to put this together to meet the needs of the city in terms of its plan document, its intentions around getting it out there, its excel accessibility objectives and all of that. And then think about how things like the story map and the hub site can actually combine together so that, like I said, there's, um, absolute clarity as to what the city's plan is in the delivery of it electronically, but there's also a forum, a potential forum for the city to have um, the ability to understand what the reaction of the plan is to people. How is it actually working as it relates to people? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that's a whole new world of, well, other than people calling up Mike or the planning department complaining, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not new, but but the, I mean, you know, that aspect of having more of a of a of a platform, a constant, a continuous platform that you as a city can maintain on the hub side of this, 
that lets you um, get reaction to plan policy, you know, policies in the plan, uh, information in the plan, but not make that so uh, intertwined with the actual plan that people think that the last comment posting is now the city's policy. That would be a real issue. Mike, um, how familiar, we've been throwing around like Esri Hub, Story Map, the Hub site, all these, all these different words. Do you guys have, um, like you, you absolutely know you want to use Esri Hub versus Story Map. I mean, I think Mark, you could show them, we could talk about Newport as the example there where mm -hmm. the Story Maps page, um, it's hard to explain without a graphic, but the story maps page is like what you were seeing with the with the Kingdom Trails website. And then the hub is like, it, you can build it out as a sort of a landing page. And you can actually go in the background of Esri hub sites a bit more and do some sort of like web developer coding magic. So you can kind of get it to work for your purposes a little bit more than you can just the pure story maps. Story maps is built to be very intuitive um people can be you know you can easily add content uh and then the hub sites are a little bit more customizable so i think what mark said as a build out the hub site as the more interactive continuing living breathing website and have the story maps as that static site would probably be our approach yeah and i would say probably john Adams would probably have been the only one who really would see the subtleties. We we kind of yeah. know what we wanted, and and I kind of threw around storyboards and hubs as if they were the same thing, and <laughs> uh, they're different. But we do have, uh, I, and I used hub in in writing the RFP because we have um, we have used hub for uh, some DPW work, and so we own a license to it, so we don't have to. Yep. So we're like, all right, well, we've got the license to that. We'll use that. But Perfect. If, certainly if there's a better, you know, we're not going to use Hub just because that's, you know, a, a yeah. things in a box. We, we want to, we've got a product that we want to reach and we're mm -hmm. hoping for consultants to give us the best tools to get there. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. And I think for the, you know, again, I think back to the stated purpose of what you're trying to accomplish, you know, those different pillars of what you're trying to accomplish within the context of what you have available to do. And, and I think for, for um, ease of future use, right. Again, you want the, you want the plan to be done when it's done. You want mm -hmm. the, the electronic version of the plan to be um, doing its job. It's telling everybody what the policies of the city are. The hub site is where down the road, if you want to ask new questions around the policies, if you want to have, if you want to get some spatial enabled data about, you know, what neighborhood do you live in or where is the issues you're seeing kind of happening? That's a great, great reason to have the hub site, right? You can, you can use that platform to gather and share all of that sort of uh, reaction to and or thoughts around the plan. But at some point, you've got to lock the plan down, and I think Story Map for us has been the kind of the go-to platform for that because it does let you, like I said, thoughtfully map out what you want to say, how you want to say it, and then develop the structure to do that. And it also gives has given us the flexibility of saying, okay, what do we like? This map I'm showing is from the Stormwater Master Plan town maps. This is raw Esri data. This is like, you know. Um, stormwater site data right, basically and there's some you know things you can sort of you can zoom around it and all that kind of stuff that's good for certain sets of data for certain information that's going to be wonderful but there is oftentimes a need to like i said to curate that if there's something really important that you want to make sure is visually compelling you might need to do something beyond what you can get out of esri conveniently <laughs> and the good news is that if it's in the if it's in the city's plan and if it's if it's established through policy it's not something that's going to be changing in a dynamic way you're i mean to change it to change a zoning boundary to change a, a policy boundary or whatever it might be that's a process the city has to go through and so i think for for this type of project i think this this idea of of 
having some maps that are more curated, more sort of visually compelling, clearer perhaps, um, that rely on some Esri data but don't sort of default to it necessarily in the interest of visual communication is probably okay because you're not going to have to go back and update those but once every number of years unless something dramatic changes. Um, whereas if there's gen like background census data, information about the community, you know, existing conditions, all of that stuff, totally could imagine a lot of that information would be just raw ESRI, raw data you have collected. It's just informative. It's just, you know, it's backdrop, right? But if there's something, if you want to take, like, for example, the, the city, the city plan, the, the downtown plan, and sort of make that a live, have a piece of that that's kind of part of the vision for the city, for example, you know, taking graphics from that work and bringing it in would provide more value to the city plan because it would reinforce what you're trying to pull, you know, what you're saying. So we have the ability, the story map to do that. Gabe, I see you Indeed. have your hand up or had your hand up. Yeah, uh, just a just a question, Mark. Thanks for the presentation and walking through some of the examples. Uh, I'm curious, like in the in your write up, you you had several examples of similar projects, but then did you say 20 or 30? Can you just give us an idea on how many of these web based plans that you've done? It sounds like you've got quite a bit more experience than you outlined in your proposal. Um. Yeah, yeah. So when I said 20 or 30, I, I, I more meant like we've used them for um, probably 20 or 30 different recent projects that are used for different purposes. So they're not always as the final planning document, as you see for Kingdom Trails or we did for Enosburg, um, but they're often used as a community engagement platform or we build them out as uh, here's what the consultants are doing. Here's your opportunities for engagement. It's just a, a pure project information website. So the ones that were highlighted were the more uh, full scale build outs that we thought aligned most with this project. Um, but in terms of just using them, I think we probably use story maps for almost every community and recreation planning project that we're starting at this point. At some level, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Aiden. Yeah, of course. So this is again, this is a ASP, this is for the city of Aspen. We did a, a big economic recreation uphill economy plan for them a few years back. This is on the older version of, of the platform, but again, very super graphically rich, super map enabled. That was the whole premise of this. Um, and I think it really works well in terms of like being able to communicate some of the complexity of the information, being able to get that out there. Obviously, these these data points, these sort of narrative scrolls really help um, communicate that. As Aiden said, the, the newer versions of the website are are better. They've there was a while there when we were really freaking out because ESRI was sort of changing the 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 templating for story maps hub sites. Like it seemed it seemed like every couple hours. And we weren't sure if a lot of our original uh, websites would work. And I, I know, you know, we've had that question come up with clients before is like, you know, um, what happens when you're done? You know, how, how usable is this? This is a good example. The city of As we work closely with the city of As They have a GIS team. They've got a couple of people that are in their office that, that do GIS. We developed this, this plan for them on our platform. And when it was all done, tested and verified and 100% working the way everybody wanted it to work. We then transferred it to their tenant in Esri. So there was no, it was actually a relatively seamless process, but I think it's a really important thing. They do, they, we, they can, they can do anything they want with this site now. It's all theirs, 100%. There's nothing that we have to do. And um, Going through currently going through a corporate website redevelopment piece for us internally, <laughs> I know that's oftentimes a really big part of you know you it's like you want to be careful about having to um, in the delivery of a document like buy years worth of maintenance and service you know it's like what's the point of that if it becomes like this constant um, drip 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 of update this update that and again I think Esri's done a good job of allowing for the sites to transfer between ownership. So if, if again, if we got it developed under our scgroup.com Esri platform, got it all dialed in, 
your city's got licensing, it should be able to transfer over there without a lot of problems. Um, that's a good thing. I think the the key though is to make sure um, we you know we know what's what we're dealing with ahead of time, so we can make sure we plan that out. So there's nothing that we own or have that you don't have that would then be, you know, technically problematic. Um, but that's a really good sort of important part of these documents is being able to kind of communicate them. Uh, 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 Aiden, could you just give uh, everybody, because this is a relatively recent project we're working on, but you're just, just starting it, but I think it's really important for the um, Friends of the Front Range Wildlife Refuge. Yeah, absolutely. So in that project, we're working with um, the Friends of the Front Range Wildlife Refuge, as well as the National Fish and Wildlife Service on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal project. Um, Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge, uh, which is right near the Denver airport and just north of the Denver area. And for that project, they're embarking on a two year sort of community listening project where a couple different consultant teams are um, doing different engagement processes with the neighborhoods close by, which are predominantly minority, majority minority neighborhoods. And they're asking questions like, what would make you more likely to recreate at the arsenal? Do you feel safe here? And we're kind of, we're gathering all that information and using story maps as um, sort of our version of a website that takes some of that information that we're learning and transforms it both to um, let the community know about the project that we're embarking on but then also use some of the best practices that we learn through these conversations. So uh, we're really trying to focus on spatially based and graphic rich content so that people can navigate the site better when they're there, have some familiarity with it, see photos of people interacting with the landscape so that it's, you know, some people think that there's, there's, these, there's bison on this land and some people don't wanna go there because they think they're gonna get trampled by bison. So showing, you know, here are the paths, here's where your car can go, the bison are fenced in. Um, just really using the website as a tool to do some of that first engagement before they get to the site. Um, and a big thing that we're learning is that the federal fish and wildlife website has a lot of rigidity to it that doesn't allow for these more um, engaging graphic styles. So we're really trying to build that in to our website. And the key thing on that I wanted to sort of highlight is that in that particular, it's, we're just starting, it's just really starting to get going. It's a two-year commitment. So it's, a, it's not something that would conflict with working on this for you, but it, it's, I think it's, it's useful backdrop in terms of our work as a planning consultancy, because a key, a key aspect of the final deliverable, it's final story map system that's, that we're going to deliver is making it accessible. I mean, these some of these communities are uh, Hispanic speaking, for example. So there, there's going to be bilingual accommodation in there. There may need to be accommodation for visual impairment in there. And I'm not saying those are all things that necessarily need to be uh, kind of sort of fully flushed out in the city's website, but it is one of the things to get back to um, accessibility of this. I think we need to be very conscientious on the deployment of, of visual information so that it does have, you know, so that the planet is as useful to as many people as possible. And I think we need to be uh, thinking about those sorts of things. So in the cities, you know, when we're making decisions about, about color choices or making decisions about, do we do a simplified graphic or a more complicated graphic? I, I would love to know where the city, you know, where the city's at on that so that we can make, you know, Informed decisions about how to you know, curate that information so that it's as, as readily digestible as to people. And obviously, there are state and federal there's federal standards. There's there's international standards for color and accessibility on web platforms. And uh, Story Map facilitates a lot of them, not all of them. I mean, see, the minute you show a map, um, it gets hard. The minute you show a you know a map that that's communicating spatial information, it's very hard to communicate that to. Uh, the visually impaired, for example, um, almost the best you can do is have a note that's embedded that says this is a map that shows X, Y, and Z, a narrative description of the map. Um, but we do want to be sort of sensitive to that 
and try to do our best to um, think about what those issues might be at the beginning of this process so that when you guys are giving us information to kind of figure out how it goes into the website, we can say, yeah, we might want to tweak this a little bit or we might want to emphasize this a bit differently so that it doesn't cause a downstream problem. And I just want to add to that. I know we're slightly over our time, but I wanted to add that I think we're really hoping that this product um, gets up to the level that the other graphic work going on in Montpelier right now is up to. I mean, I drive through there all the time and the new signs you guys have put in and a lot of the standards and the work that Montpelier Live is doing, I think is just a really, really good way of showcasing the character and energy in Montpelier. And I hope that this website uh, rises to those same standards. All right, excellent. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, you know, in, in fairness to to our other folks, we wanted to make sure we try to give everyone the same amount of time. Um, but I did I did notice that we had forgotten, especially um, for for Aiden's. Well, I guess Aiden, you might be able to to see us. We just can't see you. Um, so for introductions, uh, I'm Mike Miller. Mark knows me. Um, but we also uh, online here, we have Cameron Niedermeyer, who is the assistant city manager. We had Gabe Lajeunesse. We have um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Batista, and we have Aaron Kosicki, who the three of them are the planning commissioners. So just so you guys know, looking at your screen, who's who, um, I did apologize for not mentioning that up front. Um, but I want to thank you guys for uh, flexibility and um, everything to kind of get to where we are today. Uh, and so we're going to, because we don't have a forum, we're going to just going to be signing off today. Uh, we're going to meet up at our next planning commission meeting and we're going to have a quick deliberative session. Uh, whoever gets selected will probably know uh, pretty quickly after that meeting. And then uh, officially the way this works is we'll send it to city council with our recommendation. And that is, I believe like July 20th is the next council meeting. They're on their summer schedule. So they only meet once a month. It'll be a consent agenda um, that will go through at that time. So we'll just so you are aware of the, the schedule for how that'll go. Um, Thank you. And if again, if there's any questions that come around before you're into during your deliberations, by all means, let us know. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Really good appreciate it. Yes, thank Thanks. you. Nice to see y'all. All right. Thank you Excellent. all. Thank have you. Good, have good night. Thanks. So, so we'll see you next time, right, Mike? You're all set. Yep, I we're all set for tonight, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank you guys for first uh, hanging in there. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Bye. Take care. Thanks.